put one of the cones in the seat, and she sat on it and jumped up, and she talked about how thankful and kind she was for the warm welcome that was extended to her in a jest of irony. And I remember for the first time as a sixth grader crying in the theater because that scene resonated, did something to me, awoken another element of my humanity as a person created in the image of God. Power of story. Hmm. Strange. I never talked to my parents about that experience. But this is going on with, with story in the lives of people all the time. So while story is the dominant cultural force in our world today, it is interesting to note that story <laughs> is the normative genre in biblical revelation. In fact, 40, and to, when, I, when I say story, I don't mean fiction. It's true. It's true. Historical narratives are true. The Gospels are true. In fact, 40% of the Old Testament, a significant part of the New Testament, is story slash historical narrative. The triune God himself has chosen a narrative story as his prominent, predominant mode of self-revelation for the communication of his mind in the Old Testament and a significant part of the New Testament. In our English Bible, the longest block of narrative in the Old Testament runs from Genesis to Esther. Among the minor prophets, the book of Jonah is, is a narrative slash story. Of course, we have the gospel narratives of the New Testament and the book of Acts. I define historical narrative slash story in the following manner. Historical narrative is an account of sober history. And let me add quickly, when I say sober history, I don't mean sober history in the way we use it in the 21st century sense. 21st century historical configurations, they're ruling out God, they're ruling out the supernatural. Uh, we're not talking about history in that sense. I'm understanding history and in in, in, in that God himself has intervened in history. That this is his creation, that he's sustaining the universe. The historical narrative is a sober account of history from the Lord's point of view, related and relived in the form of story for the purpose of life transformation. The narrator accounts the history from God's point of view. Since the Lord is the ultimate author of the account, the narrator's perspective and point of view is, in fact, the perspective of the Lord himself. Biblical narrators are incredible storytellers. Their recounting is beautiful, skilled, structured. They narrate with conscious artistry. For example, it is hard to overestimate the incredible literary skill and subtlety of the narrator slash storytellers of First and Second Samuel, the narrator's skill in the use of irony, humor, flashback, and dramatic tension and resolution uh, is, is absolutely astounding. These historical accounts must be read and interpreted as story, story that appeals to our imagination, invites our imaginative participation in the events themselves, and helps us see how our own story by the redeeming grace of the Lord Jesus Christ fits into the big story of redemption. In his commentary on First and Second Samuel, Eugene Peterson adds his voice in the recognition of the quality of biblical stories. Um, there is an austere, spare quality in their stories. They don't tell us much. They leave a lot of blanks in the narrative, an implicit invitation to enter the story themselves. Let me read that again. They leave a lot of blanks in the narrative, an implicit invitation to enter the story ourselves, just as we are, and find how we fit in. These are stories, note this, that respect our freedom. They don't try to manipulate us. They don't force us. They show us 
the spacious world in which God creates, saves, and blesses, first through our imagination and then through our faith. Imagination and faith are close kin here. They offer us a place in the story, invite us into this large story that takes place under the broad skies of God's purpose in contrast to the gossipy anecdotes that we cook up in the stuffy closet of the self. The narrator of Scripture's large story, the meta-narrative of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation is God himself. Due to this great reality, the narrative accounts of the Scriptures are not content to make a claim to truth and stop there. With nuanced insight in his outstanding book, Mimesis, Eric Auerbach noted the world of the Scripture stories is not satisfied with claiming to be historically true reality. It insists that it is the only real world. All other scenes, issues, and ordinances have to have no right to appear independently of it, and it is promised that all of them, the history of mankind, will be given their due place within its frame and be subordinated to it. Note this. The Scripture stories do not court our favor. They do not flatter us that they may please us and enchant us. They seek to subject us, and if we refuse to be subjected, we are rebels. The Scriptures say no. The Scripture stories say no to our sins. They subvert our sinful thinking and ways. But they do point us to the one who can meet the needs of the human heart, the Lord Jesus Christ. The great narrative accounts of the gospel point to Jesus who said, Come to me, O who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest to your soul. The Bible is the Lord's story, and through the death of Jesus on the cross and his literal bodily resurrection from among the dead, we by faith in him have a place in a great drama of redemption, and through the preaching of the Old and New Testament narratives, we have the opportunity to invite others into the big story of redemption. Moreover, the meta-narrative of creation fall redemption and consummation is the framework in which all of life is to be understood and interpreted. In Scripture, God himself is the storyteller par excellence. As storyteller, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit employ irony, humor, uh, wordplay, alliteration, assonance, character development, tension and resolution, and the strategic giving and withholding of information. He shapes us and leads us into deeper fellowship with himself through incredible narration. But at a time when the world is feeling the seismic global impact of story for good or for evil, I note that the evangelical Bible-believing pulpit still continues to be, to some extent, in many circles, the medium of an exclusively Aristotelian approach to preaching. Abstract, cognitive, emotionless, detached, devoid of tension and resolution, and often dull. The situation is ironic in light of the reality that story, historical narrative, is the known of genre and one of the dominant theological forces of Scripture. It seems to me that since God has chosen to communicate with us through story, 
clothing, biblical theology, and plot, dialogue, setting, irony, human, people, and other artistic means, we need to understand this genre and certainly ought to cultivate our skills in clothing, theology, and story, doing more preaching from the narrative sections of Scripture. Um, some evangelical homiletics professors are attempting to address the problem and prepare the upcoming generation of gospel preachers to communicate to a world steeped in story. Many evangelical seminaries and Bible colleges today have course offerings in preaching the Old Testament narratives, uh, the narrative sections of the gospel accounts, and the book of Acts. More attention is given to preaching the Bible's various genres and the presentation dynamics those genres demand. It is an issue of faithfulness to the text, content, and rhetorical strategy in the sermon, and not simply technique. More millennials and Generation Z preachers are emerging from the halls of evangelical training institutions equipped with the hermeneutical, homiletical, and presentation skills necessary to, to do justice to Scripture's stories and pulpit discourse. By the way, I am not implying in the least that our resurgence of interest in story is a capitulation to culture. Instead, I maintain that God has providentially prepared the church for such a time as this by giving us so many stories in the Bible. Therefore, we need to continue to help students and preachers and those who are already involved in pastoral ministry in one way, shape, form, or fashion to learn how to incorporate his approach to God's approach to storytelling in messages based on these stories. Are there any preaching models better than God himself? Are there any preaching models better than Jesus himself? Are there any preaching models better than the Spirit of God? I remember someone, someone, someone gave me some very, very interesting, polite pushback about this whole idea of telling stories and said to me, don't you think that only thing that really matters is content? And yet, wait a minute, wait, wait, no, yes, yes, content matters, content matters, but I want to preach the content the way Jesus preached it. I want to preach the content the way God preached it. I want to preach the content the way the Holy Spirit preached it. In other words, I do not want to separate the Spirit of God's what from the Spirit of God's how. Are there any preaching models better than God? So God ultimately is the model for the preacher. Hmm. I think it would be appropriate for you to say amen. <laughs> oh. oh my. So I am encouraged because I know that the Lord has already raised up a new generation of biblical preachers to proclaim the gospel. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Dr. Reed. Your son's incredible storytellers. I still remember Michael's sermon on Joseph. I still remember it on Jen, Joseph, uh, Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Powerful example of storytelling. I still remember the sermon. Because what happens is stories that are lived and related well will take up residence and live long in a person's life. See, if we have narrated and relived these stories well, long after we are gone, our children and grandchildren will still hold in memory those powerfully preached stories with all of their redemptive and life-transforming implications. They will still hold these stories in memory. 
So God is raising up a new generation of biblical preachers to proclaim the gospel. But we must equip student preachers and those who are involved in ministry to become better storytellers as an integral part of gospel proclamation. We must strongly encourage them to avoid the great evangelical preaching temptation and knowing communicative insecurity, the felt need to rush to a proposition before we have allowed the story to do its work. Now, we're not saying we don't preach propositions. We are saying that there is a place and time for it, especially with narratives, allow the narrative to do its work first. Nathan, Justin, come to King David and tell him you are the man. No, he allowed, you notice, he allowed the story to do the work. And when he saw that David was angry, ticked off, thinking that the story was about somebody else, thinking that the story was about somebody else. It penetrates him because at heart he's a shepherd boy and he resonated with that man who had been taken advantage of. And at that point, the proposition comes, you are the man. So we must strongly encourage preachers to avoid the great evangelical preaching temptation and knowing community insecurity, the felt need to rush to a proposition before we've allowed the story to do its work. We have made good progress, but much more needs to be done. Eternity is at stake. I bring these thoughts to a close with some insightful words from the late Haddon Robinson. We have become a storied culture. Whether it's mystery drama or comedy or even a sports event, there is a large element of induction a large element of induction. Rabbit trail for a moment, but connected with this. Sometimes there in, in the United States, they have these judge programs on about paternity, who's the father? I have no interest in this stuff. But every now and then, I walk past the television set, and the judge says, in the case of John Doe, it has been determined by this court that, Mr. Jones, you are... Then they go to commercial break. See, this is induction. And you know what happens? Even though I have no interest in this at all, I think it's a waste of time, I've been hooked. <laughs> I'm hooked now. I'm hooked. So I, I hang around the TV set. Oh, that's by design. They set it up this way. Oh, these folk know that we're wired for story, that we're wired for induction, and if you're going to capture a person's attention and maintain their interest, inject a little bit of tension into their imagination, and you got them. So I'm hanging around. Then they come back. In the case of John Doe, it has been determined by this court that Mr. Jones, you are, dramatic pause, the father. I told you you were the father and all this other stuff, you know, all this stuff breaks out. So, no, 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 no. 
It's like, oh, God, why? And I'm, I'm, yeah, you see, they, it's a large measure of induction. Why do you think people get into binge TV watching with the Netflix phenomenon? Oh, if you're not careful in this, you can watch that all night. Large elements of induction. The drama isn't solved until the end of the last act. The joke leads up to the punchline. The sports event moves toward the final score. Inductive sermons fit that way of thinking, and the Bible is full of them. That is particularly true of a specific type of, induct of inductive sermon, a story told. You connect with 21st century listeners when you tell a biblical story with insight and imagination. The low marks we have given to story must be revived upward if we observe the impact stories make upon all of us. Television abounds with them social media, some shoddy, some shady, some shaky, some worthwhile. But TV dramas and other dramas attract audiences, note this, and shape their values. And I need you to listen to this now. The future of our culture may depend on the future of our culture may depend on the stories that capture the imagination and mind of this generation and its children. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Yes, and are, we're going to talk more about that in the next lecture, of, of, at least in the delivery of the sermon and the reading of the text. But I do want to say, here is one thing to remember. Whenever you state your big idea, you release tension. Whenever you state your big idea, you release tension. And when you release tension, interest, um, you lose the interest of people. So one of the keys to sustaining interest in narrative text is to follow the tension curve of the text, right? Um, whenever you see a question in a narrative, that's a tension point. Uh, because it's, it, it's, 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 um, it's, it raises, um, behold the fire in the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? See, how is Abraham going to answer this question? What would you say if you were in Abraham's place? Notice how he responds. You see, you see them doing to, to, to manage, to manage that tension. This is the stuff of interest. In fact, in fact, tension management trumps vocal dynamics. You may not have, you may not have a James Earl Jones kind of a voice, but if you can manage the tension well, you are still able to sustain the interest of your listeners. So that's a big, that, that one is huge. Um, tension management. You know, so think about, think about uh, the, the, um, you know, someone told a story like this once. Um, that was a big debate in class. Um, the mother had um, three children. 
One of them was born blind. The other one had serious congenital birth defects. And she's pregnant again, pregnant again, and this pregnancy doesn't look like it's going to go too well. What should the parents do? They had this big discussion about abortion. And most of the class concluded that the abortion was the wisest route to go. And at that point, the professor said, okay, you just killed Beethoven. You see, what, you see what's happening there? He could have said Beethoven was born under these circumstances, right? No, 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 we wouldn't want to, we wouldn't want to do that. But it's the way the information was structured. So tension management not only keeps interest, it's a way to maximize the teaching moment. John Dewey said that learning begins at the point of felt tension. And so that's something we need to keep in mind, I would think when we're, we're uh, telling stories, reliving and relating stories. Another thing, um, you, want, you want to do more than uh, relate the story, you have to relive the story. And again, this is where the cultivation of your own imaginative capacity is a vital part of storytelling. You have to be there in imagination, you know, smell the smell, see the sights, um, understand the circumstances, and with your imagination um, fully engaged, you're able to relive the story as if the events are happening before your very eyes for the first time. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, and take up an offering too. <laughs> well, yeah. It's sort of a question about application, and do we need to say what do we learn from the story and apply it in every narrative text, and we've got, you know, God dropping the mic, so to speak, at the end of Jonah. Well, I think that uh, we need to ask, uh, well, there's, first, there's no resolution of the tension in Jonah. So I agree with your observation is very sound. So I don't care about all these people, then you let the band play. I would think that that probably may be appropriate with the book of Jonah because that's how the book ends, right? But when you have narratives that have a resolution, so typically if you look at the plot structure of a narrative, roughly you have exposition, something that's said to set the story up. Then you move from exposition to some kind of crisis. Then in some stories you have rise in tension. Not in all of them, but in some you do. Then you have a resolution uh, that could take various forms. It could be a tragedy that is a good ending. It could be, or it could be tragedy, which is a bad ending. It could be comedy, which is a, uh, which is a good ending. 
It could be a, a, a movement from ignorance to epiphany. I mean, there's various ways what the shapes of that resolution can take, and then you have a return to equilibrium. I want to suggest that in those particular cases that there is the, the narrative is demanding from us now that this be fleshed out in life. My concern, my concern is one of the things we want to do when we apply Scripture is to do more than say you need to, uh, you need to do this or you need to do that, but to flesh the application out more. Now, what this is going to do is give people an image of what the truth looks like. It gives them an image, and based upon that image, they're in a much better position to, to apply the truth uh, to life. I do see a lot of application in, in, in Scripture, of course. Um, you have the letter to the Ephesians, the first three chapters are doctrinal, and the last three chapters are basically application. You got the first 11 chapters of Roman, which is this massive treatise on justification by faith and um, the, the place of Israel and God's plan and the present day, so forth and so on. And then you have application, don't you, basically, and, 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 and the remainder of the 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, well, 16, rather, is basically the application of it. So we do have a biblical basis for the application. And, and I want to suggest, I want to suggest that since these narratives are not giving us full orbed ideas. You, you know, for example, in um, the tale of two cities, Jonathan, Ed uh, not Jonathan Edwards, but uh, Charles Dickens' novel, the, 12, the, the Tale of Two Cities, for about 18 chapters, he just narrates, basically, I mean, he's talking about really the causes of the French Revolution in narrative form. And then at the end of it, he states and restates his point in the narrative. Scripture does not do that generally with Old Testament narrative. This is not to say that we don't have some thematic statements, every man did what was right in his own eyes, we don't have, but those are not necessarily uh, big ideas in the way that we're understanding it in terms of an overall theme of a section, right? So we have to do that work to find that big idea, and once we find it, once we've discovered it, uh, then to help people flesh it out in life. Uh, so I think it depends on the text. I think Jonah might actually be a good, an interesting place to end there because this is what the text does. So I would say just take your clues from the narrative. I hope that helps. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. I, that's a struggle for preachers, believe it or not. That, that's a struggle. I'll tell you the reason why. Because if you look at Genesis um, 37, where Joseph, as, you, know, you know, Jacob loves Joseph more than any of his sons, makes him a coat of many colors, brother selling him into slavery. Then you got Genesis 38 with Judah, Tamar, uh, 39 with uh, Potiphar's wife and, and Joseph, and then, um, then he's left in prison, so forth and so on. And what we want to do, what typically what preachers want to do is rush to 50, Right? and allow 50 to have the primary place in interpreting 37. So he sold into slavery, but, but it's going to work out. And I want to suggest to you that we kill the narrative when we do that. We kill it. Think about this for a moment. So Joseph is what? Is 17 years old when he sold into slavery, right? How old is he when he comes into power? He's 30. 
So what, so what, 13 years have gone by. By the time we get to Joseph emerges to power, 13 years have gone by. Okay, so you got the seven years of famine, what, plus, so by the time that's over, that's 20 years. And so Joseph's brothers meet him two years into the famine. So we're talking about what, what, 22, 23 years have taken place. And we, we, don't do in, we don't do justice to this massive amount of time that's taken place by rushing. So by the time we get to Genesis 50, almost 40 years have taken place and the brothers are still burdened with guilt because of what they did at 37. Let 37 speak on his own terms. Communicate to parents that favoritism destroys families. Favoritism. Jacob, who also is going to go through a process, favors Joseph. And I know he has his dreams and all of this stuff, but the narrator's focus, Jacob loved Joseph more than all of his brothers because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. I mean, have you ever thought about that? And his brothers hated him for it. Favoritism destroys families. Now, I used to assign that text as an exegetical paper. Just 37, helping students to learn how to deal because the story has a sense of opening and it has a sense of closure, even though it's a part of a cycle. See? And I've assigned this to students, and the student wrote back, and she says, I just learned, so she comes from a godly home now, right? Good, good mom, good dad. She's a, but she, I just learned last week that before my mother came to know Christ, she had an abortion. And it was a boy. She came to the Lord. The Lord changed her life. But my mother always favored her son. and didn't love us girls. And I'm just now beginning to understand that it was driven by guilt. She favored the boys because she never could get over the fact that she had aborted her own son. You see where I'm going with this? So no, let it speak on its own terms. Help folk. If you're in a family and and you, you got to help parents with this. Because this is a problem, even among Bible-believing Christians. Now, this becomes more pronounced, this is more pronounced in some of the communities of my Asian students. Some of my, I have interacted with some of my Asian students where this is a major problem. No, this couldn't possibly be the problem. Well, yeah, it is. That's what the problem is. He showed favorites. And mess his family up. Then walk us through 30, uh, uh, through, through 38, which is also going to be about another 20-year period, actually. Because by the time we get to the end of 38, that's about the time when Joseph and, and Judah are going to meet up again. Right? Then we got this flashback in 39. Let's go back 20 years now, applause or so. You, you see where I'm going with this? Manage that tension. Then when we get to 50, after we have walked listeners through all of this stuff, then get there and say, you can reflect theologically on your pain. That's how you don't keep a grudge against the family member after mama or daddy is dead. Think theologically about the pain. You meant it for evil, but God... Good, and I'm going to argue strenuously is that we short-circuit that narrative process if we rush too quickly, resist the temptation. That makes sense? And incredible stuff. Yes, sir. Um, That's good, okay.
reversing this situation and feeling the reality of it, but without running the risk of putting additional words in God's mouth or putting in like background motivations or how, how do you make it feel alive without just shooting too much? How do you handle the dialogue without reading too much into it? You can say something like this. Do you hear the tension in her voice as she says? Do you hear the surprise in Boaz's voice as he says, Who are you? Do you hear the concern in Mary's voice as she says to Jesus, They have no wine. You see what I'm, you see what I'm doing? So in other words, in context, Try to capture to figure out the tone, the, the emotional stuff that's in the voice. I tell you who's a master at this, Leo Tolstoy. War and Peace and this other novel that he wrote, I forget the name of it, Anna. Yeah, yeah I mean, he's, he's good. Two things he's good at. He's good at the smiles. He's, I, I mean, he almost has a billion descriptions of smiles. And the, the, the vocal stuff, the way people are talking, so in context, try to, uh, try to capture the emotion of the voice. And helping listeners do that will be a go along way in helping them to, to get at the narrative. Well, I, I think that's it, right? Yeah, God bless you. Thank you. We now have our break, and it will be uh, until 3 o'clock, I believe, and then we will ask you to come back, please. Thank you. Don't forget, the bookstore is closing, so you need to pick the books up if you want to buy any now. <laughs>